So, all right, everybody, we are going through 1 Samuel chapter 28 through 31. So we're finishing up the burnt book of 1 Samuel this evening. Uh, we're going to power through these last four chapters. There's a lot in them, um, but I think uh, a lot of action. So we'll be able to kind of talk through it, I think, pretty straightforward and through a lot of it. So let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. Uh, thank you for the gifts, the blessings that you pour out on us and that you give to us. Uh, just continue to lead us and guide us. Um, open our hearts so that we would learn what you desire for us to know in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so uh, you can see there listed that uh, first question there is, uh, what's a gift from the Lord uh, for which you are thankful? And I'll have you guys share in person. That I'll, I'll talk with Pat up here so you guys... Uh, you guys can talk uh, in the room and I'll talk with Pat. So, okay. right, so we're just uh, sharing those things that we're thankful for and uh, just uh, I'm thankful to God for all the blessings that he provides for us. Um, and so let's go ahead and, and start reading uh, 1 Samuel 28, 1 through 14. Pat, could you get us started with that tonight? 1 Samuel 28. I can do that. Yep. Uh, it came to pass in those days that the Philistines gathered their hosts together for warfare to fight with Israel. And Ashit, H, how would we say his name was? Pronounced? I think we said it Akish is how we've been pronouncing Akish, it. Akish said unto David, uh, I don't like this version. I'm sorry, guys. Going back to my NIV. In those days, the Philistines gathered their forces to fight against Israel. Achish said to David, you must understand that you and your men will accompany me in the army. David said, then you will see for yourself that your servant, uh, what your servant can do. Achish replied, very well, I will make you my bodyguard for life. Now Samuel is dead and all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in his town of Ramah. Saul had expelled the mediums and spiritists from the land. The Philistines assembled and came and set up camp at Shunan, while Saul gathered all Israel and set up camp at Gilboa. When Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid. Terror filled his heart. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by dreams or Urim or prophets. Saul then said to his attendants, find me a woman who is a medium, so I may go and inquire of her. There is one in Endor, they said. So Saul disguised himself, putting on other clothes, and at night, he and, the two men, he and two men went to the woman. Consult the spirit for me, he said, and bring up for me the one I name. But the woman said to him, surely you know what Saul has done. He has cut off the mediums and spiritists from the land. Why have you set a trap for my life to bring about my death? Saul swore to her by the Lord. As surely as the Lord lives, you will not be punished for this. Then the woman asked, whom shall I bring up for you? Bring up Samuel, he said. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out at the top of her voice and said to Saul, why have you deceived me? You are Saul. The king said to her, don't be afraid. What do you see? The woman said, I see a ghostly figure coming up out of the earth. What does he look like? He asked. An old man wearing a robe is coming up, she said. Then Saul knew it was Samuel, and he bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. All right, thank you. All right so um, I'm going to go through uh, a little bit of the, the, the maps here just to make sure we're all on the, the same page with this. Um, so the Philistines, uh, Saul had pushed them back to the coast for a while, but they still hadn't given up their desire uh, to control uh, more of the interior land of, of Israel, uh, especially the trade routes. And so I'm going to just go ahead and share my screen here, and we're going to just look through a couple of these maps here as we go. I put a map on your, your handout as well. Um, and so as we look at the this map, um, it's a little bit bigger than the one that you have on your handout. Uh, just orientate yourself again. On the left side is the Mediterranean Sea. Um, if you look in the kind of the bottom middle there, you see the Dead Sea. Uh, the Jordan River flows into the Dead Sea. You can follow all that up all the way to the Sea of Galilee. Uh, that kind of frames the, the Holy Land there, the land of, of Israel. If you go from the top of the Dead Sea towards the Mediterranean Sea, um, you'll see um, uh, Jerusalem. It's not listed. It's on Jebus on this map. 
um, and then just north of there is Gebbia, uh, is, is Gibia, um, and that's where the yellow and the green lines come out of on, on our map of that view. Um, that's where Saul was from, and so Saul's from the very much the interior of the land of Benjamin, uh, just north of what's uh, what became Jerusalem. You go farther to the left, uh, you see that uh, reddish line uh, that's going up uh, north. That starting uh, the the southernmost point of that line is is Gath, the Philistine city of Gath. Um, that's not on the map of your handout yet in front of you. Uh, you guys have more of the, the top area there. And so the Philistines, that red line really follows where the Philistines are attacking this time. So in the past, they've gone straight east to try to invade the, the central Benjamin Plateau, the very middle uh, of Israel there. This time they're pushing north. Uh, they're going north along the coastal plain, and then they're crossing over the Carmel mountain range. Uh, so that's... Uh, this right here, you can see my, my, my uh, you can see where the, uh, the mouse pointer is. That's the Carmel Mountain Ridge. So they're passing over there um, and they're going through either probably Megiddo or Tanakh. Uh, those are uh, famous cities there in the Jezreel Valley. So they want to get in and control the Jezreel Valley. We've talked about this before. This controls the trade uh, routes from uh, Tyre and Sidon, the Phoenicians, all the, 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 uh, coastal, the, the ship traffic uh, that's coming into the land of Canaan. It's also uh, controls the best east-west route to get um, to the um, Rift Valley and up to Damascus. And so if you want to control trade in Israel, if you can control the Jezreel Valley, uh, that's even better than where they were going before. So this is uh, a bold mood on the Philistines' parts. They're going farther north, uh, but they're trying to get to um, um, control this area here the Jezreel Valley and the Herod Valley, uh, very flat um, and good trade lands. So here's, uh, this is more of the map that a little closer zoomed in where you guys are at. Um, so Israel is going to be in Jezreel. Um, that's way up on the north of this. You can see that maybe on your map. Um, Shunem, they have Shunem in this map in the wrong spot. Shunem should be almost north of Jezreel. So um, if you go like a... Um, just, if you go to Jezreel, just north where my mouse pointer is there, that's really where Shunem is, and Endor is just a little bit farther north and to the east. Uh, they have Shunem too far east on this map. Yeah, so um, Shunem is just a little too far north, a uh, little too far east. Shunem should be right over here. Um, but this is really where um, you can see it. Um, Saul comes down from Gibeah, he goes up. Um, and he gets to Jezreel. Eventually, he dies on Mount Gilboa. That's the end of the chapter today. Um, I want to show you what this looks like in real life, though. Um, um, so you some pictures. Um, the first pictures I believe I'm going to show you, I'm standing over here in Megiddo, looking over the Jezreel Valley. And so you can, this is real life, but uh, a, real, a, real, a real glimpse of that with those, not just a map. Yeah, what it looks like today anyways. And so, uh, I'll show you some pictures from Megiddo here. I'll show you some pictures from the north side of the where I'm standing up here on the Nazareth Ridge, uh, looking at um, down on the Jezreel Valley as well. So this is uh, looking, um, so I'm standing in the, the ruins of Megiddo, looking across um, the, Jezreel, or the Jezreel Valley. Um, this mountain range, these hills, uh, basically spanning the whole distance in front of you here, where my mouse is going. That's Nazareth Ridge, or Nazareth is somewhere right over here, the, the modern day and the ancient city of Nazareth where Jesus grew up. You have this little cute little mountain over to the right. It's nice and circular. Uh, that's Mount Tabor. Um, and you can, if you're in and around this northern part in, in Israel, it's very distinctive. It's circular. It looks, uh, somebody described, one of our teachers described it as, it looks like a mountain shook. It's just perfectly round and, and conical. Uh, there. Um, so I'm standing in the same spot for, the, oh, oh, sorry, no, I'm, so I'm jumping across the valley to Nazareth Ridge. This is looking at Mount Tabor from another direction. You see how circular it is, just conical. So it's very distinctive. doesn't matter where you're at, uh, you can see Mount Tabor. So going back to the, um, going back now to um, Megiddo, I'm on the, the west side there of the valley. You can see Mount Tabor right over here to the left. That circular mountain. So I just shifted our view a little bit more towards the east. Um, this 
here, uh, this little hill mountain is called Mount Moray. And right here down on the southern end of that is Shunem, where Philistines camp. So they came up through where we're standing. Uh, they got across the Jezreel Valley, um, and then they camped there in the, the foothills of that little hill, that little mountain called Moray. All right over here off to the right, as you see, the, it kind of flattens out a little bit. That's the Herod Valley. If you go down there, there's another valley that takes you down to Bethshan and then farther down to the Jordan River. Uh, over here to the right is Mount Gilboa, um, where maybe Mount Moray and Mount Tabor are more kind of one hill with, uh, you know, one little hill. Mount Gilboa is kind of more of a, a series of hills in a row. And so it stretches out a little bit farther off down to the south. So, all right. So our setting here for our battle is right between these two mountains, Mount Moray and Mount Gilboa. All right. So I'm going to show you just a, another picture here. Um, this is um, this is Mount Moray um, from Nazareth Ridge, from Nazareth, looking uh, kind of off to the east. So this is, uh, so if you go to the right where we can't see, that's where Mount Tabor would be in Jezreel. So this city right off here to the right, um, the, the very far side uh, where the mouse pointer is, that's where, um, that's where um, Shunem would be. Um, Endor, where the witch is, is about right over here. And this little village right in the middle, right in between the two, it uh, doesn't come into play in this account at all, but it's uh, probably a village you've heard of as uh, knowing my audience that's here. That's the village of Nain. So if you remember, Jesus um, is traveling and he's got his whole entourage with him. And coming out of the village of Nain, there's a woman with her dead son on a funeral pyre. Uh, and he touches the, the beer, the, the, the pyre, uh, and he comes alive. So this is the, the, the healing, the, the raising from the dead of one of uh, the miracles of Jesus is right here in Nain, right on Mount Moray. And so uh, Saul, like I said, is farther to the right. So to, for him to get all the way to Endor, he actually has to go behind enemy lines to get to this medium, to get to this witch. He could have circumvented the other way, um, but he'd have been going through more hills. But either way, um, there's a force between him and um, between him and Endor unless he's going straight over the mountain, which again, maybe to avoid them he was, but he's, either way, he's putting himself in danger there. Okay, all right. Um, this is uh, where the Israelites camp. This is Jezreel. Um, where I'm standing, there was later a tower built and erected, and that's more of the time between Jezebel and Ahab, uh, right in this place. Uh, but I'm looking north to Moray. So um, this village right off here to the left, that's where Shunem would be. Um, this is where the Israelites were camped. Um, I'm looking, so this is the edge of, so this little edge of the mountain here, this is the edge of Mount Moray here. This is the spring of Jezreel. Um, so that's where a water source that have been there. And then if I'm looking, so on this picture, imagine I turn all the way to the right and I'm following the ridge line back. That's what I'm looking at here. This is that's the Mount of Moray or the Mount Gilboa extends back and uh, back and towards the east. So somewhere over here is where Saul would have died in chapter 34. So that's uh, what's likely there. So that's a little bit about the setting of our story, of our account. Um, I might flip back to a picture if we're, we're kind of struggling, kind of picturing that in our mind as we're going. Okay. So uh, the Philistines gather for war. They gather in Shunem in the Jezreel Valley. That's on the north side, um, um, the north side of the valley, Je uh, Jezreel Valley on opposite um, opposite there of Mount, um, uh, I'm sorry, of Mount Gilboa and Jezreel, but they gather um, in Shunem. Uh, they're striking across the Carmel mountain range, right? That's why they're, why they're going there. They're hoping to divide Israel in half and control the trade routes through the Jezreel Valley from the Phoenicians, from Aram and Damascus in the north and from Egypt in the south. Israel gathers on Mount Gilboa, specific at, same, at Jezreel. Um, we heard about Jezreel last time we met. Does anybody remember who was from Jezreel? David's wife, Ahinoam. So David knows the significance of this area. Uh, and David's wife is even from this area. Right? Um, 
And so um, it's a stretch of, so they're on Mount Gilboa, it's a stretch of hills on the southern end of the Jezreel Valley going into the Herod Valley. So David is uh, going with the Philistines, right? Because he's been their sheriff, right? Achish has given him this land in the south to, to patrol and, and control down in Ziklag, way down in the south. Um, and they're going to war. And so Achish says, you got to come with me. And David, or David says, okay, now you're going to see what kind of man your servant is. Um, and I read one commentator that said, well, David's answers are intentionally vague here. You can read that however you want to. You can hear that however you want to. We could say, yeah, David, you, we're going to see what kind of servant he is because David hasn't told Achish the truth. He might double cross Achish in the middle of the army. He'll, he'll see what kind of servant you are, right? Uh, what kind of servant he is. Um, Agish read it the other way, didn't he? He's like, oh yeah, you've been loyal. I've seen that. I've seen all this plunder you've taken from your own people, which really wasn't from his own people. Um, and, and so, um, you know, so David says he can see what his servant do. Remember, he doesn't say he'll fight for him. Um, and your servant there is just an honorific. It's just a, a way to say, I understand you have power over me right now. Achish, though, sees this as a pledge of loyalty um, and views it more than just an honorable title. And he makes David his bodyguard. Uh, literally, that means the keeper of his head in Hebrew. Um, and so uh, David's, you know, he's charged with protecting Achish's life. And so with him, soldiers that are there. He did keep another Philistine's head too, didn't he? He was the keeper of Goliath's head. So that's kind of fun that way too, right? Um, yeah, thanks. That's good, good, good irony, Tom. I like that. Um, so what does Saul do? So that's what happens. They're gathering, they're moving. We'll find out more about just the specific movements of David. Um, David doesn't make it as far as Jezreel. We'll find that out uh, in the next chapter. Um, but we, we look at Saul as he gathers in Jezreel. He inquires of the Lord, right? That's what you're supposed to do before the battles. But what's the problem? God isn't answering him. Are, are we surprised by that, having read through all of 1 Samuel, that God's not answering Saul when he's calling out for help? Because what's Saul really trying to do? He's trying to manipulate the Lord. He's trying to make God do what he wants. Has God already given Saul his answer? Yeah, the kingdom is going to be ripped away from you, Saul, and it's going to be given to another. Uh, Samuel said before he died, you won't see my face again, right? Um, so this is, uh, you know, God isn't answering me, so he wants to inquire of the Lord. And so um, his problem is he struggles because he can't find a medium, um, someone who can communicate with spirits. A medium is a go-between, right? Medium uh, between one person and another, a go-between. Um, and so what's, what's the irony there is he had gotten rid of them out of the land. And, and one of the moves where Saul actually did the right thing, you know, and now he's, he's like kind of upset because now he wants one, right? So he's, he get, they won't let anybody else do it because it's not right, but he's willing to do it himself. Um, and so um, he's trying to make God talk to him. Yeah. So, right, he's trying to make God talk to him. He got you with me on that, right? God, God's not answering, so I'm going to make God do make God do this. It fits with Saul's character, right? Where he's trying to make it happen all the time. He's trying to add to what's supposed to be there, and so he's going to make God happen to him by channeling Samuel, who speaks for God. So he's not going to God directly. He's trying to make somebody that that goes for God directly. But Samuel's dead, so he wants to talk, bring somebody back, bring uh, that can talk to him as, uh, in a spiritual way to make Samuel do in death what he refused to do in life, right? He wants to bring a message from the Lord through Samuel to himself, right? The woman's afraid of what will happen to her if Saul finds out, and they go to Endor on the other side of Mount Moray. It's behind the enemy lines, again, depending on which way you go. Um, but either way, he's separated himself between from the, his army, and the enemy army is much closer to his camp than he is. Um, and so... Um, Saul not only does what isn't right against God's commands, he puts himself at risk and his whole army at risk to do it. Right. Questions, comments, thoughts on that? 
in, that, in verse five, it says that he didn't seek what God wanted him to do until he saw the audience closer and made him afraid. So his only, his only reason for doing this is because he was afraid he was going to be beaten. That's a great point, uh, Tom. He, he doesn't inquire of the Lord immediately. Um, he doesn't inquire of the Lord before he leaves Gibeah. He inquires of the Lord after he sees the Philistine army. Yeah, and, and yeah. I mean, it's the complete opposite of what David does. So, well, yeah, what David does when he... Chapter 30. Yeah, yeah. I think we've seen that example, too. We're going to read about what David does in chapter 30. Um, he inquires of the Lord, and the Lord answers. Um, one is inquiring out of fear and obligation and trying to manipulate the situation. That's Saul. Um, David is inquiring out of faith and trust and obedience. And right before he inquires, and I know we're not there yet, but right before he inquires in, in verse 6 of chapter 30, it said, But David strengthened himself in the Lord with God as opposed to being afraid like, yeah. like uh, Saul. Was. Yeah, so I, I think again, we see the we see the, the contrast between David and Saul. It, Saul is afraid and acts out of fear, David acts out of faith. Uh, and trust even when things are difficult. Um, and so many of the Psalms bear that out, right? The Lord says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Now, that's not words of Saul. Saul's afraid. Um, and, and we see this fear that uh, drives him to do uh, things that uh, he shouldn't be doing at all. So um, let's go keep reading. Uh, 1 Samuel 28, verses 15 to 25. I'm going to go ahead and read that one for us. Um, then Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Saul answered, I am in great distress, for the Philistines are warring against me, and God has turned away from me and answers me no more, either by prophets or by dreams. Therefore, I have summoned you to tell me what I should do. And Samuel said, Why then do you ask me, since the Lord has turned from you and become your enemy. The Lord has done to you as he spoke by me, for the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, your neighbor David, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord and did not carry out for his fierce wrath against Amalek. Therefore, the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will give Israel also with you into the land, hand of Phil, the Philistines. And tomorrow you and your son shall be with me. The Lord will give the army to Israel also into the Lord will give the army of Israel also into the hand of the Philistines. Then Saul fell at one at, at once, full length on the ground, filled with fear because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had not, had not eaten anything all day and all night. And the woman came to Saul, and when she saw that he was terrified, she said to him, Behold, your servant has obeyed you. I have taken my life in my hand and have listened to what you have said to me. Now, therefore, you also obey your servant. Let me set a morsel of bread before you and eat, that you may have strength when you go on your way. He refused to eat. I will not eat. And he said, but the servants, together with the woman, urged him, and he listened to their words. So he arose from the earth and sat out on the bed. Now the woman had a fattened calf in the house, and she quickly killed it. And she took flour and kneaded it and baked unleavened bread of it. And she put it before Saul and his servants, and they ate. And they rose and went away that night. So this is uh, an interesting passage, and there's lots of people that comment on this for, for a variety of reasons. But kind of the, the first kind of thing, just as you take yourself out of the story and just look at it from a theological point of view and, and what's going on with this is, what should we make of Samuel appearing before Saul, right? This idea that someone who has died, who is you know, with the Lord, comes back through a medium, through this witch, and speaks to Samuel. Now, notice we'll take a step back and just explore that a little bit from, from what's going on from a spiritual point of view and a theological point of view. Um, when, when there's something extraordinary that happens, something beyond the normal, something uh, supernatural that happens, there are only two choices of the source. You follow me on that? There's only two possible ways where that supernatural thing can come from. Either it's of God or it's of the devil. There are no other choices. Those are the only, the only uh, beings with power to do the supernatural. And, it, and I'm lumping God and his servants, Satan and his servants, if you will. So uh, there's only two sources of that power. 
And so we're left here with saying, is this God allowing Samuel to come and talk to, um, to Saul? Um, and, and this could be, if it's God, I think it's one of two ways. One, God allows um, this exception to this rule where people don't come back from the dead, all that kind of stuff. And he allows Samuel's spirit to go and talk to Saul directly. I think that's one possibility. I think the other possibility here is that this is a spirit from the Lord appearing to Saul. Um, and God's making it look like Samuel or sound like Samuel uh, so that Saul might be able to understand it. So you flip on the other side, and if it's a demon, right? And that's what, as we as Christians look at what mediums and um, people that conjure the dead and seances and all those kinds of things, um, if there's real power in that, when there's real power, that is maybe a better way to say that. Um, that's not from the Lord. And, and that's not the dead person that, that you're trying to call. That would be a demon. That'd be a, a minion of Satan. Does Satan have knowledge? Absolutely. Does, could he impersonate um, and sound like or act like or talk like and know things that maybe only you thought they and you knew? Absolutely. Uh, he's the great deceiver. He can disguise himself as an angel of light. And so it's possible that this could be um, a demon described um, here would be the other possibility of what's going on here. But the fact that the, and so. So at first, at first Saul's like, what do you see? And then, um, so let's go dive back into this account here, right? So. Saul's like, what do you see? So he can't see what's going on, but the woman sees clearly, and this freaks her out. This is a, a woman who does this professionally, and what she sees is not like anything she sees before. It's as like a god or like a spirit or like a ghost with power, right? So it's, it, there's more authority with this spirit than she's ever encountered before when she's done this before. Um, again, that points that, that maybe this is from the Lord and not from the devil. Okay. Um, it seems like she flees. She gets so freaked out from this. She leaves the area for a little bit and Samuel talks directly to Saul and, and they talk with each other um, for that next, next section, that next passage that's there. Um, and so as we dive into it, I'm inclined that it's one of the first two that it is either Samuel that God allows uh, to come and talk to, uh, to Saul. And I think there's a, some reasons for that. One, uh, the Bible calls him Samuel clearly. Uh, two, he's ticked off that he has to leave the presence of the Lord and come and talk to Saul, right? Why have you called me here, Saul, right? Three, the message that he gives is one that is completely in line with the message of God in scripture. It's not trying to deceive. It's not trying to do anything beyond what the message of God had already delivered through Samuel in life. And so I'm inclined that it's that first one that God is allowing Samuel to return this time. Uh, the other option that I've heard, if you think it's, you know, well, God does, wouldn't send an angel to do that. He wouldn't send Samuel to do that is that it would be a demon, but God has the power to constrain him and only allow that demon to speak exactly what he wants to in the way that he wants him to. Uh, so that's, I've heard that uh, explanation too, but I'm inclined to think that this is kind of an exception to how things normally go. It's our right, you know, and so um, when we look at these things in, in real life, we, as Christians, we don't want to get involved with mediums and witches. Um, Saul did the right thing by kicking him out of Israel, right? They were, you know, if they're calling up the dead, they're not really calling up the dead most of the time. What they're calling on is an evil or an unclean spirit. You're opening the door to the occult, uh, and to the devil, his, his minions, his army um, in the midst of that. Okay. Um, but the message there, I think, is what's even more interesting. So why are you surprised that God's not answering you? Why are you surprised that you're not getting an answer? You turned away from the Lord a long time ago. Why should, you know... And God ripped, you know, the kingdom from your hands. You turned away from the Lord. You didn't listen to his word. So God turned from you. Of course, he didn't answer you. Oh, and by the way, you and your sons are going to be with me tomorrow. Right? Which means you and your sons are going to die tomorrow. Right? So 
Again, this is not a message saying, you know, Saul, you maybe should just go back home, right? That might be the message we expect the, the devil trying to thwart God's plans if it was one of his, his legions to say. Uh, but no, this is, um, Samuel tells Saul exactly what the truth is, not what Saul wants to hear uh, to spare his life or to uh, be comforted. All right. Saul's response is he's weak, he's terrified, he lies on the ground, uh, and finally the witch and his servants can convince him to eat food and be strengthened, and they leave that night and return to the army. So this is a covert operation. Um, Saul gets his answer. Um, he makes Samuel talk to him, um, but it's not anything he really wanted to hear. Okay. Questions, comments, thoughts on that section of scripture? So, yeah, so the, that's a great question, Ed. The, the question is, you know, it doesn't seem to be in Saul's character to outlaw the mediums because he's not really caring about God, what we see most of the time throughout his life. Why would he have outlawed them? We're not surprised that he goes and seeks one out, I think, as much as we're maybe surprised that he had outlawed them in the first place. I think that's kind of what your question or your comment is at, at right, Ed. And, and I think, remember, Saul did a lot of good. Um, and Saul, um, despite his faults and failures, um, there are very few, if, if, and I don't know if there are any instances where he goes against the worship of Yahweh. This is like the first time where he's maybe stepping outside of looking, you know, worship of Yahweh, but in his mind, he's doing it to try to get to Yahweh, right? Um, he's maybe not the most spiritual person, but he's not leading Israel in worship of false gods and false idols. Uh, we don't see that anywhere in, in the book of Samuel that Saul is, is doing those things. And so I think in that line, to get rid of the bad is not necessarily against what Saul would do. He's not doing it to try to have all these great reforms. He's just trying to be in line with, with what he thinks a good king should be. Remember, he starts off by doing that, of trying to do all these right things. And I think that's more what we see here is it's, I don't think it's Paul having some, you know, piety or, or something there. I think it's, he's just trying to be a good king when he makes, whenever he did this. And this might have been early on in his rule. Um, and he, and at, at first he does a good job with stuff, but then slowly he kind of moves away from listening to God's word or he picks and chooses what part of God's word to listen to. Yeah, and, and so when he, when he knows he's going to lose the kingdom, when he sees the Philistine army there, God's not answering me. I got to get him to answer somehow. Well, maybe I, maybe there's a, a medium, a witch left in Israel that, that can do an end around on God for me. Yeah, he, 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 still, he still knows God is God. So it's not that he's not believing in God. He's just not always listening to God. Yeah. Which is what got him in trouble in the first place. Yeah. All right. Yeah, great. Thanks for that comment, Ed. I appreciate that. So compared to some of the later Israelite or Judite kings, yeah, for, um, when, you, when you look at the, the spectrum of the kings of Israel and Judah, uh, he's better than every single one of the kings of Israel. Um, because all of the kings of Israel worshipped false gods and encouraged the people to do the same. Saul never does that. Um, for, for, his, for his faults, he never encourages the people to worship anyone other than the true God. Now, he doesn't always listen to the true God, which is where he gets into trouble. But he never encourages or leads the people away from worship to, of the true God. And so I think that might be a, a fine hair to slice, but I think that's kind of that's kind of what we see the, the dichotomy with Saul. Um, it's not that he doesn't believe or follow Yahweh. It's that he doesn't believe or follow Yahweh with all of his heart and listen to all of his instructions. He kind of makes up his own stuff as he goes along. Well, I think God told me to do this, but I think this would please God even more, right? And so he always adds to it or puts his own spin or his own interpretation on it. Uh, sometimes you, you could say, well, he had pure motives. He was just trying to do something that was right. 
or in trying to improve upon it. Or you could say, well, he was trying to manipulate or game the system with it. You could go either way, depending on your view of Saul. He's a sinner, like all of us. Um, um, but I think the contrast between he and David, because uh, David also is a sinner, um, is that David tried to seek God's heart in all things. He didn't get it right all the time. But David was also was seeking after what God desired for his heart. Um, even when he messed up, then he would repent and turn towards God. Where Saul would, you know, make excuses and everything else along the way. All right, good. Let's keep rolling here. Um, can somebody read for us? And if you're in the room, why don't we grab the mic? Um, third, uh, 29 verses 1 through 11. So it's the whole chapter 29. Um, and it's the account of, of what happens here with um, David is going uh, with the king of Gath, that's Achish, from Gath up towards Shunem into the Jezreel Valley. But before they get there, uh, they make it as far as Aphek, which is, uh, if you're looking at the map, the, I have the pointer looking right at it there. You fix that dot there on the coastal plain. Uh, they make it as far as Aphek when they're kind of taking an inventory of all the peoples and groups uh, that are there. Because there's some Philistines, but there have been other groups and other kings or lords or, or, or militias that had come along with them, people that owed them a debt. And so these guys are all passing in front of the lords of the Philistines, and they see David and they have this accusation or this conversation um, and some argument about David and his men and their presence there. Um, Aphek, if you remember, that's where the Ark of the Covenant was captured way back in the first part of Samuel. When the Philistines captured the Ark, they were at Aphek. And so they're taking the same line, uh, and, but they're just going farther north now. Um, Ed, are you willing to read that? Uh, chapter 29 for us. Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. At this point, the Ark of the Covenant is down here south um, in a town, um, I think it's Kiriath Jerim, um, is where it's at. Um, you know, um, half dozen miles or so, maybe from Jerusalem. Uh, you know, so um, because remember, it was only with the Philistines about nine months. They sent it back on a cart. If it went towards Judah, then it was of God. Their their tumors, their struggles, uh, whatever their 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 ailment. Um, and if it didn't, then it wasn't. But it went right towards the the Jewish town um, town of priests. But they don't handle it right, so they continue to send it on its way, and it goes to this guy's house where it's at and so just like the like the bread of presence was a knob and the um the you know so they had part of their worship in one place and the ark was in another place and so all of their worship is disjointed at this point it's not all in the same place yeah go ahead Ed. now the philistines gathered all the forces in aphek and the israelites were encamped by the fountain which is in jezreel as the lord of the philistines were passing on by hundreds and by thousands and david and his men were passing on in the rear with Achish. The commanders of the Philistines said, what are these Hebrews doing here? And Achish said to the commanders of the Philistines, is not this David, the servant of Saul, king of Israel, who has been with me now for days and years? And since he deserted to me, I have found no fault in him to this day. But the commanders of the Philistines were angry with him. The commander of the Philistines said to him, Send the man back that he may return to the place to which you have assigned him. He shall not go down with us to battle, lest in the battle he become an adversary to us. For how could his fellow, how could this fellow reconcile himself to his Lord? Would it not be with the heads of the men here? Is not this David of whom they sing to one another and dances? Saul has slain his thousands. And David is ten thousands. Then Achish called David and said to him, As the Lord lives, you have been honest, and to me it seems right that you should march out and in with me to the campaign. For I have found nothing wrong in you from the day of your coming to me to this day. Nevertheless, the Lord does not approve of you. So go back now and go peace peaceably, that you may not displease the Lord of the Philistines. And David said to Achish, But what have I done? What have I you found in your servant from this the day I entered your service till now, that I may not go and fight against the enemies of my Lord and King? And Achish made answer to David, I know that you are a blameless in the sight as an angel of God. Nevertheless, the commanders of the Philistines have said, He shall not go up with us into battle. 
Now then, rise early in the morning with the servants of your Lord who come with you and start early in the morning and depart as soon as you have light. So David set out with his men early in the morning and returned to the land of the Philistines. But the Philistines went up to Jezreel. All right, thank you. All right, so it said, uh, I don't know if you caught that there, the Israelites gathered and camped by the spring that is in Jezreel. So you see this little uh, you know, cluster of trees right down here. That's where the spring of Jezreel is. And so uh, springs don't generally move over the course of time. Um, they're generally in the same spot. So that's where Saul was camped with his men, somewhere between where I'm standing um, and this spring. Um, so it's kind of a cool thing to think about. It's like, that's where they were. Um, so David is, is going, um, and again, you can hear in David's words, you can almost read them a couple of different ways, depending on um, your perspective. Um, the other Philistines' lords, though, they see David's presence, and they're angry with Achish. How could you let this guy who is a champion of Israel, who has killed you know, hundreds, if not thousands of Philistines over the years, how could you let this guy in the midst of our camp? You're letting a spy and an enemy camp with us and go with us. You know, in the middle of battle, he's going to turn on us. What better way can he repay his Lord and get in his Lord's good graces than if he turns on us in the middle of his battle and takes out all of the heads of the Philistines? Um, and so that's why they're angry. That's why they don't want David there. They're, they think he's going to switch sides during the battle. Um, and Achish, though, he defends David. He says David's deserted uh, Israel to join David. He's deserted Saul to join David. He's been with me for years. No fault. Um, which means David's ruse, if you remember, has worked. Uh, because for the last you know, year and a half or so, David's been lying to Achish um, and telling him he's been attacking Judean cities when really he's been attacking Amalekite and other cities, uh, enemies of Israel. Um, and so the outcome is that David has to go back. He can't fight um, with, in the battle. Let's just put it that way. Uh, but even in his disappointed response, he doesn't give away his allegiance. He says he wants to fight against the enemies of my Lord, the king. Which king? God. But he always, but every time he talked to Saul, he said the same thing, didn't he? My Lord, the king. Right? And so, um, Achish obviously read that one way. And so Saul's able to remain in his good graces. But maybe David was intending to fight against the enemies of his Lord, the King Saul, or the enemies of the Lord, the King of God, uh, King God Most High, right? So even his answer, it's kind of interesting, this, the, the way that David's answers could be read a different way, depending on um, where you know David's heart is. Well, you know, if, if you look at this, it says that, that Achish and his men went back. Yeah. Because that's where David was. There had been a battle. Saul would press in from the north, and at the opportune time, David would switch. Yeah. I mean, they would have had their, the, their, their rear guard, you know, the Philistines in a picture. Yeah. They would have been surrounded. They'd have had the, the attack from the beginning, and then they'd have been hard pressed from the back, and it had thrown the army in confusion as they turned back to get the new oppressor. Saul could have pressed in. And, yeah. But God wanted Saul to die. So, so uh, David, yeah. So, here's the next question there is, is kind of where Tom's leading this is how is God guiding these events? Um, he doesn't have David present when Saul is defeated, right? Um, the whole army, all the people will suffer because of Saul's unfaithfulness, right? Um, that, that was what Samuel said. The, the army is going to be defeated. Your sons will be killed. Um, you know, your people will suffer all because of Saul's unfaithfulness. And so if David isn't present, he doesn't have to be put between his people and the Philistines. He is not able to save Saul. Uh, he isn't there to raise a hand against the Lord's anointed or be tempted to do that either. So I think even in David's not being there to fight, God is protecting David even as he's carrying out his judgment against Saul. Um, because David doesn't suffer this defeat. Uh, David isn't there to... Um, try to intervene one way or the other. He's not put in a difficult position. Um, it, it can't be said that it was David who killed Saul. You know, it, none of these things are there. David, God, through all of it, I think, not only is he, not only is he, is he acting in judgment against Saul for his, 
his uh, unbelief and for his, well, for his disobedience is a better word than unbelief, I guess, for Saul. But he's really protecting David from in these ways too. Any, any other thoughts on that? Just as we're talking about that there. Okay. Right, so, uh, so this is all happening. Uh, so that first couple of verses, it says, um, the Philistine army goes to, um, goes to Shunem. So probably there's a garrison, there's an advance guard that got to shoot him and it has a, a um, has a, a military garrison there. They've got a, a stronghold there. Saul and his army are coming up from Jezreel. The rest of the Philistines are trying to hurry to come up and defend their position that they've taken. And this is all, so there are all these things, Saul, as Saul's going around to the, the, the witch at Endor. All of these things are kind of, I think, happening at the same time uh, as, we, as we read here these, these chapters. And then at the same time, the next day, while the Philistine army goes farther north, crosses over um, the Carmel mountain range uh, through Megiddo, and then into the Jezreel Valley, David and his men are taking a two or three journey home to Ziklag. And we have this, uh, this detour um, of what happens there in chapter 30 to David um, and his men in the midst of this. Again, I think how this shows is, is Tom was talking about this earlier. We see Saul's character when he's under stress, what he does and how he operates. We see David's character when he's under stress and how he operates. They both try to inquire of the Lord, but their hearts are in two completely different places. And so I think we see, um, you know, when David's kind of held up against Saul, we see David clearer and sharper of how he's um, following after God instead of Saul who's following after himself. So I think that the author is, is lining these two events up brilliantly, even as these events are happening simultaneously. All right. Okay, would somebody read for us um, 1 Samuel 30, verses 1 through 6? Michelle's going to read that for us here. Thank you, Michelle. One through six. David and his men reached Zik Ziklag on the third day. Now the Malachites had raided the Negev and Ziklag. They had attacked Ziklag and burned it, and had taken captive the woman and all who were in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men came to Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire, and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives had been captured, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the love of his God. All right, good. So, um, David uh, and his men find when they return to Ziklag that it has been burned, it's been raided, um, that their families have been taken captive by the Amalekites and the, all his soldiers. Now, these are the guys, the 600 men that have been with him for years. They've been through thick and thin with David, uh, but this is a breaking point because their wives and families and kids and um, they're, they've been taken too, and and they're they're at a breaking point, and they want to take it out on David. They want to stone him to death. They want to kill David. Um, is is what the result of this is? And so, what's David do? He doesn't run away. He doesn't uh, doesn't say you know you know it's your guys' fault. He doesn't play the blame game. He doesn't try to make himself innocent. Um, he strengthens himself in the Lord. Um, and I think that's just a great phrase, right? What, what do you do when you're struggling? You strengthen yourself in the Lord. And then the question, I guess, is maybe how did David do that? Um, we're not told exactly how he did that. Maybe he prayed. Maybe he was reading some of the scriptures. Maybe he was singing some of his psalms that he had written. Um, you know, how do we strengthen ourselves in the Lord, though? Prayer, 
reading God's word, being in worship, receiving the sacraments, um, talking with other Christians, right? But when we face trial, adversity, struggle, it's so important to um, not look to ourselves, not look to blame others, but to just strengthen ourselves in the Lord, get grounded in the Lord. Um, because the reality is, and I was a part of a, a meeting today and the devotion was there and they were reading up something by Luther. And I thought it was, um, I don't remember what it was from, but Martin Luther had written this, that it was, he was talking about if, if you remember and you know and you believe that the Lord is with you, it doesn't matter what else happens. Let the plague come is basically what he's saying. Let, let adversity come. What can that do to me compared to with the strength that's on my side with the Lord? You know, all this other stuff may war and rage against me. But if I'm secure in the Lord, I know that my, that my eternity is secure and that the Lord will be with me through whatever I face now. And what, great, um, what a great mindset and what a great um, attitude, faith-filled attitude to have. And that's what I believe David was doing too. And he read through so many of the Psalms. The Lord is my light and my salvation. I quoted Psalm 27 earlier. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance me to advance against me to take my life, I will not fear. Right? It is they who will stumble and fall. David knows that the Lord is with him, so nothing else can compare to that. Yeah, he faced some awful things in his life. He, he was weeping right along with the rest of his men until he had no more strength left. But he was strengthened by the Lord because he knows even in comparison with that, that the Lord can see him through uh, even this dark time. Um, again, what a difference between he and Saul. Saul goes through a dark time. What did he do? He tries to take matters into his own hands. He tries to make something happen. He tries to, to force it to happen. He tries to kill David. He tries to kill his son, right? David, he strengthens himself in the Lord. All right, let's keep reading on. So can you read a little bit more for us? Uh, 7 through 15. Then David said to Ab Ab Abiathar. Abiathar, the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. Abiathar brought it to him, and David inquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, he answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. David and the 600 men with him came to the Besor ravine, where some stayed behind, for 200 men were too exhausted to cross the ravine, but David and 400 men continued the pursuit. They, fought, they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David. They gave him water to drink and food to eat, part of a cake of pressed figs and two cakes of raisins. He ate and was revived, for he had not eaten any food or drunk any water for three days and three nights. David asked him, to whom do you belong and where do you come from? He said, I am an Egyptian, the slave of an Amalekite. My master abandoned me when I became ill three days ago. We raided the Negev of the Ketherites and the territory belonging to Judah and the Negev of Caleb, and we burned to Ziklag. David asked him, can you lead me down to this raiding party? He answered, Swear to me before God that you will not kill me or hand me over to my master, and I will take you down to them. All right, thank you. So, details of David's pursuit. First, he inquires of the Lord, right? And so he's not assuming, he doesn't take his whole army and then inquire. That's what Saul did, right? He inquires of the Lord. God, what do you want me to do? Shall we go after them? Will you, will you give them into our hand? What, what should I do, God? I don't know. Um, you lead, you guide um, in the midst of this. And the answer is clear. Yes, go after them. I'll give them into your hand. And so David takes his 600 men and they go in pursuit of their wives and their families and this raiding party. Um, they don't know at this point if they're alive or dead, but they go in pursuit of them. They get to about 10 to 12 miles south of Ziklag. Um, and a third of them, 200, are too exhausted from sorrow, from grief, from a hard march. Remember, they've been traveling. This is the third day already they've been traveling um, you know, for war. Uh, they're too exhausted to go any further. And so they probably left part of the, 
their, their baggage, their, their stuff with these guys and the 400 keep going on. And in the midst of the wilderness, this is a dry, arid place. Um, it said the, the brook uh, Besor um, or the ravine Besor, I think is what Michelle's translation had. Um, maybe some of yours says the brook Besor. Uh, this would have been a, like a wadi. So the, whenever there was rain, if there's, because there's just a, it doesn't rain very often, whenever there's rain, the canyon fills up and it becomes a brook. But probably most of the time it's a dry creek bed with the ravine. Uh, in the midst of this. Um, I don't, I'm not, Nahal is like that, is that river, but it's also the, it's a wadi. It's a wadi. Yeah, yeah. That sounds a bit of fun. Yeah. It's the Nahal, the sewer. It's still there. Yeah. And so again, you know, unless there's major earthquakes, most of these routes don't necessarily change that much significantly. So this area, they know where this is at. They leave them there and they find a guy in the wilderness. He's an Egyptian slave of the Amalekites. So probably the Amalekites raided closer to Egypt and they were able to take a slave from them. And this man's been serving the Amalekites there, uh, but he's expendable. He can't keep up. They're not going to wait for him. Um, they're not going to put the whole operation in, in, um, at risk by staying with him or slowing down. And so they leave him behind. Uh, so David's been find him. They nurse him back to health. And um, he's willing to lead them to where these raiders are from in exchange for his life, for his freedom. Uh, and so that's what happens. So let's get reading on uh, chapter 30, verses 16 through 31. I'll go ahead and read that one. Um, and when he had taken him down, and when he had taken him down, so that's the Egyptian had taken David down. Behold, they were spread out over all the land, those the Amalekites, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. And, Judah, and David struck them down from twilight until the evening of the next day, and not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who had mounted camels and fled. David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken, and David rescued his two wives Nothing was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that had been taken. David brought it back all. David also captured all the flocks and herds, and the people drove the livestock before him and said, this is David's spoil. Then David came to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow David, who had been left behind at the brook Besor, and they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. And when David came near to the people, he greeted them. Then the wicked, right, then the wicked uh, and worthless fellows among the men who had gone with David said, because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except that each man may weed away his wife and children and depart. But David said, you shall not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given us. He has preserved us and given into our hand the band that came against us. Who would listen to you in this matter? For as his share is who goes down into battle, so shall his share be who stays by the baggage. They shall share alike. And he made the statue and a rule for Israel from that day forward to this day. When David came to Ziklag, he sent part of the spoil to his friends, the elders of Judah, saying, Here's a present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. It was for those in Bethel and Ramoth and the Negev and Jatir. Uh, in Eror, in Sithmah, in Eshtemawa, in Rakal, in the cities of the Jeremilites, in the cities of the Kenites, in Horma, in Borshan, Borashan, in Akka, Athak, in Hebron, for all the places where David and his men had roamed. All right. He doesn't just give it to the Judites, he gives it to the so, so David, David gives it to, he's being strategic here. He's building these alliances. Um, he's, he's very smart. He's learned a little bit over the years as David goes. So um, the results of the battle, David and his men destroyed all but 400 of the Amalekites. Remember, they're 400 themselves. But with the strength of the Lord and his might, they, for a whole 24-hour period, they're wiping out this army. Um, and they rescued their families. They rescued all their possessions. Um, not only did they rescued their possessions, but all possessions of all the others that they that this band had raided. Right. So they're multiplying their possessions. Uh, this is maybe an exponential multiplication here. Um, 
and they take the plunder um, of these people and all of their flocks and herds that they, um, except the 400 camels that the guys rode away on. Um, but all the rest of it, they're driving back before David. Uh, David becomes um, wealthy instantly overnight along with his men with him. Um, and the problem arises because you have 400 that go and fight in the battle. They put their lives on the line. 200 don't. Uh, some of the 400 say, these guys, we'll give them their families back, but they don't get any of the plunder. And David says, look at the abundance that God has showered on us. Those that stayed behind and, and guarded the baggage, they get the same amount as those who go down to the battle. And then you get this interesting side note, and it became a statute of Israel, and it still is till this day. And so that's the editor basically saying, Hey, that's, this is where this rule comes from. If you ever wondered, you know, why we have this rule in our military, this is why. It's kind of explaining something that everybody knew, but maybe didn't know where it came from. Um, um, and then uh, David, yeah. And so God provides David in an unlikely way with, um, um, and what's David do with the spoil? So God provides for David in this unlikely way, right? David is almost killed by his own men. That's how this chapter starts. His men are, have lost absolutely everything. David's family has been kidnapped and, and doesn't know what's happened to them. But through it, God provides him with even more than he had before. His family is rescued. His possessions are restored and then multiplied. Um, and so just God provides in this unlikely way. He turns tragedy and devastation into great gain for David. And, and David does with this spoil. He sends it to the leaders of the clans of Judah into this area in the south. He really is building his coalition. Uh, and there at the end too, he's also thanking those um, who, that looked out for him when he was on the run from Saul. Because right? David was traveling all through this area when he was on the run from Saul. And so he's sending them a gift saying, Hey, it's I'm coming to my own. I'm going to remember those that remembered me and looked after me. Um, and so he's really doing the opposite of what Nabal had done. Remember Nabal and, and Abigail? David said, hey, I looked after your herds and your herdsmen. Would you please give my men something to eat and feed my, my guys? Nabal refuses, right? David, though, he sees the kindness that all of these lords of these cities have given to him by not turning them over to Saul, except for the Ziphites. He doesn't send anything to them, if you notice. Um, he returns, though, their kindness to him with kindness, with possessions, um, strengthening the bond, the coalition, um, saying, basically telling them, because you looked after me, I'm going to look after you. Uh, this is what I do for my friends. For those that, that love me, are loyal to me, they care for me, I'm going to make sure you're taken care of. And so David sends them this unsolicited gift. Um, as we look at maybe ourselves, though, um, God provides for us in an unlikely way, too. And, and maybe, maybe you've thought of that before, or maybe you haven't, but when we think about the cross, Jesus' suffering and death are not a good thing. It's awful. That, that God would save through suffering and death is, is unlikely at best. And, but yet he, through that suffering and death, he defeats sin, death, and the devil. Through suffering, he provides us with life and forgiveness uh, more than we ever had before. And, and so we can look at that parallel. You know, David, in the midst of his tragedy, through an unlikely way, provides him with great wealth. Um, for us, through Jesus, in the midst of tragedy, and Jesus' tragedy, he provides us with great wealth uh, of life forever with him. All right, questions, comments, facts, thoughts before we uh, make this push here now to uh, the last chapter of 1 Samuel uh, and really uh, see the demise of Saul. They had 400 that ran, right. Yeah, but when God's on your side, when God's on your side, numbers aren't important. Uh, it's, it's really, I, I think, what we've seen as we've studied the Old Testament and, and, and as we look at these things. You know, Jonathan and his armor bearer, you know, get the, the Philistines on a route earlier in Samuel, right? 
when, when God's with you, it doesn't matter how many you have, when um, a little shepherd boy can defeat a giant, right? When God's on your side, the, the numbers aren't, aren't what matter. Um, and so, um, yeah, so I think the other thing you can look at too, from a human perspective, um, that's not discounting or, or, or downplaying anything I just said. What are they doing when David comes upon them? They're dancing and drinking and revelry, right? So how inebriated were they? Probably a little bit. Um, and, and so um, they probably weren't in the best fighting condition when David and his men come upon them because it's already twilight, it's towards evening. Um, they maybe have been drinking and celebrating for a while. Um, and so, um, again, that doesn't downplay or discount the great victory God gives David and his men. But that, that's maybe the human side of it to, to look at in the midst of it, too. Another way God provided that came on him at the right time, right? Yeah, exactly right. All right, um, let's go to 31. Um, somebody willing to read 31 verses 1 through 7? If you are, Michelle's got the microphone. She'll bring it up for you, Tom. Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines overtook Saul and his sons, and the Philistines slew Jonathan and Abinadab and Mal Malchishua, the sons of Saul. The battle pressed hard upon Saul, and the archers bound him, and he was badly wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, Draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and make sport of me. But his armor bearer would not, for he feared greatly. Therefore Saul took his own sword and fell upon it. And when his armor bearer saw that, saw that Saul was dead, he also fell upon his sword and died with him. Thus Saul died, and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men on the same day together. And when the men of Israel who were on the other side of the valley and those beyond the Jordan saw that the men of Israel had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they forsook their cities and fled and the Philistines came and welcomed them. All right, thanks, Tom. All right, so um, we've got uh, the result of the battle. Saul's sons are killed. Uh, Saul's um, been injured. Uh, he's not able to escape. He knows that he can't get away. He's been uh, pierced with arrows. Um, he tells his armor bearer to kill him because he thinks it's more dignified to die that way than the Philistines come and, and injure him or pin him down and then have sport with him. Um, the armor bearer won't do it. He respects Saul. He respects the Lord's anointed. He won't take Saul's life. Um, and so Saul uh, ends his own life. Again, Saul takes matters into his own hands um, in, in the midst of this trying, you know, and uh, the arm bearer does the same thing. Um, and so Saul is, is killed, uh, dies by his own sword um, that way. Um, so um, this, uh, so the, here's where the, the men of Israel were down by the spring of, of uh, Jezreel. They fought probably in the valley. They fled to the right and then I'll just advance there. This is Mount Gilboa, so they probably fled uh, trying to get up into the highlands. Uh, the Philistines pursued them, um, and the, the course of the battle took them east and south into the mounts of Gilboa. Um, so that, that's, um, that's what happens to Saul. Um, so Jonathan was killed there too, right? It was that his three sons were killed, I think, there in verse... Uh, um, in verse 2, it mentions Jonathan by name that he's killed. So Jonathan is killed there, I mentioned by name. Um, so the Israel army is routed. But more than that, um, all of these cities that are around here, uh, Shunem and Nain and Jezreel and Endor and all of these cities where there were inhabitants of Judah, they see the result of the battle and they most likely east, 
um, over the Jordan River or onto the other side. Um, and that's probably, I say most likely, because that's where um, one of Saul's grandsons, um, Saul's commander. So interesting of Saul's commander, uh, Abner, lives. Uh, he is not killed in this battle. Um, and he tries to um, set up one of Saul's grandsons as king. Uh, that happens in 2 Samuel. Um, and they start over on the east side of the Jordan River. Um, so if you go east from here towards Jabesh Gilead, that's kind of the area where this um, Saul's grandson is kind of set up as king and then they try to come into Israel uh, the, onto the other side of the Jordan. So that's, uh, um, but so that all these inhabitants, they, they pick up and they leave because they see that the Philistines have come into their area. The Philistines are pushing them out of their land. Um, when God gave them the land, um, they drove out the inhabitants from before them, and they occupied their cities, right? They um, harvested um, plant, uh, grain that they didn't plant. They harvested grapes that they didn't plant. Um, and now the same thing is happening. The Philistines are taking their farms and their vineyards and their houses and dwelling in them. Um, and, and so... Um, this is a bad day, not only for Saul, but it's a bad day for Israel. Um, now, yes, it's centered in this one area, but what's bad for part of Israel is really bad for all of Israel and essentially drives a wedge um, right here. Um, now the Philistines control that everything north, right? This is still Israelite territory all around Galilee is separated from everything south. Uh, and so they're really divided by the Philistine presence in the midst of that. Okay. All right. All right, let's uh, finish up. Is somebody willing to read the last uh, part of First Samuel for us? Linda's got that for us. Thank you, Linda. From eight to the end. The next day when the Philistines came to strip the slain, they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount, Mount Gilboa. So they cut off his head and stripped off his armor and sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to carry the good news to the house of their idols and to the people. They put his armor on the temple of Ashtaroth, and they fastened his body to the wall of Bethshan. But when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Bethshan. And they came to Jabesh and they and burned them there. And they took their bones and buried them under the tamarisk tree in Jabesh and fasted seven days. All right. So thus ends first Samuel. One of the kind of downer way to end, right? Um, so let's just talk about that a little bit. Um, the Philistines do the body of Saul. They cut off his head, um, reminiscent of what David did to Goliath. Um, we aren't told what happens to his head, but his armor, um, his armor goes to, to be in the temple of one of their gods of Astra. Um, and they fasten his body and the body of his sons to the walls of Bethshan. Um, so Bethshan is, is farther to the east. I think that's on your map there. If you can see that towards the Jordan River is where Bethshan is. Um, this is one of the only times, if not the only time it's mentioned in scripture. Um, but it's, it's one of the few times it's, it's mentioned and it's, um, it's not a major city in terms of biblical stories that counts, but in terms of the ancient worlds, it is, um, really important place. Um, so if you think of, uh, it controlled this major trade route, it's right in a great position. It's got good water stores. It's got a good, uh, industry through the trade that passes through there. Um, it's, there's a little hill there. It's in a defensible position. It's close enough to, to places like, you know, it's not that far to the Sea of Galilee. It's not that far to the Jordan River. They're not too far from Jezreel Valley or the Mediterranean Sea or Tyre and Sidon. They can get to all of these places with relative ease. And so it becomes a, a major city um, throughout its history. There's many different layers of the city, uh, but especially in Roman times, this is a principal city in Galilee. Um, there's a major theater that's built there. Um, it's a major center of commerce and other things. Um, so this is, uh, I'm standing in um, 
This is the Roman city. I'm standing in the Roman part of the city. That's where the columns were there. Those columns, that street, none of that would have been there during Saul's day. But if you look back to the mountain behind, that's actually not a mountain. That's a tell. That's the layers of the ancient city that have built up over time. And so somewhere on, on one of these layers would have been um, where the city of Beth Shan would have been in Saul's day. And so you can imagine as you're passing by, probably the road would, would, might have gone on just on this side and then it went around farther back that way. Um, it would have gone around the city. You can imagine Saul's body and his son's body hanging on the wall for all to see. That's what it was for. Look what we did to their king, to your king. Um, that's what this message is to display. This was a major commerce route, major travel route uh, for Israel and for everyone else. And the Philistines are showing off their power and prowess in Israel's weakness by hanging Saul's body on that mountain. So you can, on the tell, right? On the city walls. Especially been there. Egypt. For 200 years, that Sean on top of the tell was an Egyptian garrison. And they found a ton of Egyptian. So, so Egypt, this was a strategic city in Egypt. It was a strategic city for Israel. It's a strategic city for Philistia. Philistia. It's a strategic city for Rome. Um, so you can, this, it's in the right spot in the right place. It's not a major player in biblical accounts, um, um, but it is in history. And so it's interesting that this is kind of where it makes its page, ways in the pages of history here, and you can see this Romans, this Roman, uh, this Roman city here with the street, the main way where where the group is walking here. I think that might is that you, Tom? Did you have an orange hat? Uh, you know, I can't remember. Anyways, yeah, but uh, no, no, is that on the first trip or second? Trip? This is our second trip. Okay, somebody with an orange hat. I th yeah, I can't tell for sure. Oh, that's right. That would have been Linda. So, um, so I think that's on our second trip. But I, I can't remember for sure. But um, it wasn't the, the streets here wouldn't have been there. There might have been little outcroppings of houses or something around there, but a village. But the, uh, it still was a major city at that point. So they, they put the, they fastened his body to the wall um, and, and all would see it. And so, uh, the inhabitants of Je uh, Jebesh Gilead, they come and rescue Saul's body. Why on earth would these men risk their lives to, to, to go by night, to go and take down Saul's body, to rescue him and to give he and his sons a proper burial? And the answer is not, well, he was their king. He's just, they're just doing what's right. There's more to it than that. To, yeah, so remember back in, in uh, earlier in 1 Samuel, this is Saul's first major campaign was to, to rescue the people of Jabesh Gilead. They're the ones that um, the Ammonites had come to and said, be our slaves. And they said, okay, we will. Um, um, and the and Ammonites agreed well, only if they would let them pluck out each an, an eye for each person, right? So that they wouldn't be able to rebel or fight against and be shamed that way. They send out messengers. They said, give us a week to decide. Send out messengers. Saul uh, rallies all of Israel. They go and defeat Ammon, rescue Jabesh Gilead. Um, most likely, Saul also had relatives there. If you remember, we talked about that at the time, too. Uh, back to some of the Benjamites, took wives from the area of Jabesh Gilead. Um, and so these men, uh, maybe near or distant relatives of Saul, people that had been saved by Saul, um, they risk. Um, this military operation. Yeah, they go by night, uh, but they, they go and they take down Saul's body from the city. Uh, they burn them and then gather their bones um, together in an in honorific way, a proper way. But don't what? Uh, bones, bones will burn if you get the fire hot enough. Otherwise, um, you know, just the tissue, if it's not a hot enough fire, the bones won't burn. Yeah. It's my understanding. I'm not an expert on that, but that's my understanding. We have cow bones that, yeah. That's why uh, you have crematoriums and things like that. They're, it's, the fire is especially hot. They designed them to burn hot enough to burn bone. 
Um, but um, my understanding is just a regular wood burning fire will not get it hot enough to burn bones. Yeah, Tom? When, I, when we were digging in Greece, we found a, a barbecue or even pit where they burned. There was a lot of charred bones in there because yep. they didn't get hot And enough of the bone and many of them are zoo archaeologists can identify what kind of animals yeah. they were. Many so even. Even in archaeology, and I read that in different archaeological magazines or, or different yeah. some of those things, is they'll find burn pits and they can tell um, about the society whether that was a place of, for ritual burning or burial, whether that was animals, whether that was people. Um, they can tell you what kind of animals uh, were involved in those what things based on it. Food? Yeah, food or for sacrifice or any of that, just by the way of the bones. When we do archaeological digging, and this is true of every dig I've been on, we find animals. Because the zoo archaeologist can look at it, and by the, just the markings on the bone, he or she can say, "Oh, well, this animal was slaughtered and sacrificed, or this animal was a wild animal who just happened to be killed, or this was used for food production because you can see the butcher marks." Yeah. The bone. It's amazing. Right? Yeah. So, so yeah, so bo bones don't. Short answer: bones have to be hot enough for them to burn. All right, so. Um, about the of this uh, let, let's finish and then we come back because we're, we're running near the end. So, um, so um, Saul's biggest struggle, I'm uh, just kind of wrapping this up of just the, the kind of thematic pieces here. Saul's biggest struggle um, is that he didn't listen to or obey the word of God. We kind of already talked about that tonight. Um, he did what he thought was right instead of what God said. And remember at the end of Judges, if you studied that book, the big problem at the end of the book of Judges was everyone did what was right in their own eyes, right? And Saul continues in that, just as Samuel predicted the kings would do. And so um, this, uh, this affected Saul's mistakes, Saul's struggles. They not only affected Saul, but others around him, right? David's on the run. Jonathan's not going to be king because of Saul, uh, Saul's actions. His sons get killed. Nob and the uh, the city of Nob and other priests are killed. The Israelite army is routed here. The Philistines have victory of the Israelites. Israelites abandon their towns, all because Saul doesn't listen to the word of, of the Lord, because he does what's right instead of listening to the Lord. Um, but, but as we look at this, you know, with through the eyes of the cross and through the eyes of, of, of God's action, um, God uses even these bad things for his ultimate good. Um, it doesn't make these things any less bad. It's not good that Saul had to die. It's not good that Jonathan and the sons were killed in battle. It's not good that the Israelites lost their towns. None of that was good, but God used it to bring about a change in revolution where David could become king, uh, where they could become a people after God's own heart. And even more than that, where David could become king and eventually his descendant would reign on David's throne, Jesus, forever. God was working towards the ultimate good in that. Um, David's response when things go wrong, we talked about this earlier, he goes to the Lord. Um, he trusts that the Lord is with him. Unlike, you know, contrast that with Saul, Saul uh, tries to manipulate God. Saul tries to, to take matters into his own hands. Um, he doesn't trust in the Lord. He trusts in himself um, or despairs of himself. And we talked about how we can trust in God even in difficult times. Uh, even when we're in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, we can trust in the Lord that he is with us and he's going to guide us. Tom, we've got a couple minutes. I finished that a little faster than I thought. Yeah, you can go ahead. If anyone wants to look at this, in this book, there's, and I'll leave it back there for a few minutes, you can see what gets on, what they found there. And the Roman city, interestingly, is one of the very few cities that's ever been completely excavated. And there's a kind of interesting story behind that that's long, and so I won't get into it. But it, there's no more archaeology to dig down here. And one of the mysteries of archaeology is they've never found the Iron Age wall that Saul was hung on. We know there was a wall there. There had been a city that size. But for some reason, they've never found it. And probably what happened was later, people took it down when they moved down here and reused the material. Yeah. So there's no, there's no wall. I mean, you can't go and say, oh, this is the wall that Saul was hung on. Yeah. So it's uh, the, the nostalgia of, of the past is really a modern phenomenon. Um, I don't know if that's a good way to say that, Tom, but, but the yeah, nostalgia of the past and preserving what was 
is really a modern phenomena. Um, otherwise, what was the past was a great resource. If somebody already had a cut stone for you, you were gonna reuse that in, in something you wanted. Um, why would I preserve this thing that's, that nobody's using anymore? I'm gonna take it and use it for myself and what I want. And so, hey, polished stones, smooth stones, cut stones, that would be great in my house. I'm gonna go up there and take it. Um, and so the, the nostalgia of, oh, we gotta preserve what was, um, that is more, that's a, that's a very new concept um, where we wanna look at the past and learn from those things. Um, one other note on Beth Sean, um, they've got their um, kind of by the theater, um, they've got a the cool theater there, but by the theater, they've even uh, excavated um, the privies, the bathrooms. Yeah. And so you can see the bathrooms there. I don't have a picture of that. Yeah, they, they do. Let me see if I can find a picture of that before we close. I, I know maybe this isn't interesting to you at all, but but I thought here, here's an example of an ancient public bathroom. I'll show you that uh, here. Um, just uh, let me find it there. Did they? Well, this is this is not an outhouse. This is, but from an outhouse comparison, this is this is you know public toilet. But it is pristine. This is what the Romans did. So this is this is around the time of Christ, and so. So so here here's what you've got. You've got two pieces of cut stone, they're, they're an angle on each one. Um, it's wide enough for you to put one side of you on each side of it. You'd hike up your, your, uh, um, your, your toga, whatever you were wearing. You'd sit down on there, um, you'd do your business. There was a water channel that flowed around everything, taking the waste out. They'd have a clean water channel in the place right in front here where you could wash, your, wash yourself and then you would get up and go back into the theater. Um, seems that way. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you are wearing, you know, everybody's wearing a longer thing. So you're, you're not uncovering yourself, but you are doing your business around everyone else. You're literally right next to everyone else. People have perfected the art of practice for a long time. Yeah. Because you, if you look in Israel, there's a spot Iron Age, and they left the stone where they found it, and it's a it's it's a portal, and the kind of thing that's yep. it, it, it's called it's that place it's called the, the Milla, and it's real close to where David's palace was, but it's probably from about the time of King Hezekiah because they rebuilt the places, but it's it's there, and it looks like a modern toilet. It has a hole, and it has a the little front is open for. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. and but the thing is, you know where the where the outhouse was, what were the house? Was it? The kitchen. The kitchen. Kitchen. Yeah, so right next to where they cook their food is where they took care of their so, so that that's a little <laughs> that's a that's a little aside tonight. So this has nothing to do with Saul, has nothing to do with David, but as we see through this um as we see through 1 Samuel, um, the, the struggles of Saul are not new to the leaders and to the people of Israel. They're the same things they were struggling with for during the time of the judges that they struggled with uh, during the time of Joshua, during the time of the Exodus, during the time of, of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the same struggles of trying to listen to the word of God, to trust in God's word. They're still struggling with the same things. And it's still the same things we struggle with. Will we trust, will we listen to the word of God? Will we trust that God is going to act for us uh, in mighty and powerful ways and maybe even unexpected ways? And that's where our faith leads us to go, is that in the midst of even struggles, um, we have a God who works in awesome, amazing, unexpected ways despite our failures um, and our unfaithfulness. He is faithful to us. And we see that in the people of Israel, that he doesn't leave them without leadership. He doesn't leave them without a person to lead them and to guide them. He doesn't leave them without his word. Uh, David, uh, yes, they, they lost the battle. Yes, they lost their king. 
Yes, they lost this first dynasty, uh, but God has something even greater now in store through David um, and ultimately through Christ uh, for the people of Israel and then for us uh, by extension. So uh, God is continuing at work, even though it, uh, we, we see this uh, downfall of the dynasty of Saul. So let's, with that, let's go ahead and close with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for today and for the blessings that you give. I thank you for your word, Lord, which is alive and active. Um, you know, even as we, we study and read about these accounts 3,000 years later, um, Lord, the, the themes, the, the struggles, um, the faith, it, it still rings true today. And so help us to believe and know that you are a God who lives for us, who is for us in Christ, uh, who works for us, even in spite of the awful things that go on around us. You are with us and care for us because of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, everybody, have a good rest of your evening. Pat, good to see you. Have a good week.